Okay, make your way back to your seats, please. Favorite drinks for the fall, anyone? Dave, what's your favorite drink? Uh, apple juice from Davidson Orchard. Okay, that's pretty good. I respect that. Freshly squeezed. Freshly squeezed apple juice, okay. Anyone else? Okay, that's like my drink every day, but <laughs> yes. Pumpkin chai. Pumpkin chai. Levi, what's your bougie drink? Fancy drink. I don't have one. Oh, wow. I just drink lattes. Rebecca said on taco, though. Well, that sounds pretty good. Okay, I like that. Yeah, every fall I start off with like the pumpkin spice season. Don't judge me, okay? I feel like you are already, so I'm just a little bit. Um, I get a long shot Americano Misto with one pump of pumpkin spice. That's me being crazy. That's wild. That's wild. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pray, and we'll get into the sermon in Mark chapter 15. Um, thanks for being here. Let's pray, and we'll get in this passage. God, thank you for who you are. I thank you for your presence. Would you meet people here today? Jesus, we see who you really are not who we've constructed, not who we want to make you to be, but who you really are, Jesus. I thank you that you, you lived, you died, and you rose again, so be free from sin, Satan, and death. You want that change us, shape us, form us. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, I was in Quenell, and um, I was at a friend's house, and a friend was asking me, they haven't seen me in a long time, they said, so are you still in Salmon Arm? And I said, ah, no, actually, I'm in Kelowna. And they're like, what are you doing in Kelowna? I'm like, well, I'm actually moved to Kelowna to start a church up, you know, in the theater. I'm like, oh, interesting. And well, and I was in a room full of people, and, and someone said, well, I hope you were one of those churches that, that met all during COVID, you know, stuck it to the government. And I was like, okay, great. And then someone else from across the room said, I hope you didn't be like those people. And you honored and respected the people who might be sick and could, or vulnerable and could get sick. And, and all of a sudden, our room was divided. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is, this is a barn burner. But you think about the political climate we live in, the political climate that you and I are in right now, post-pandemic, 2022. Elon Musk just tweeted a while ago, about politics, and he said that, you know what, when you look back in the last 20 years, people were a little more central. The political parties were a little more, like, centrist, and actually in the last little bit, they've become more and more polarized as we've become. I think people have a hard time with politics. That We're looking at Mark chapter 15 today. We're talking about how Jesus responds to politics. This is a passage every pastor wants to preach, Right? If you think about our culture and how polarized we are, is that because of Facebook and social media has actually entrenched us in our own echo chambers? That we actually just want to affirm and believe whatever we want to believe. And maybe that's the reason why we're more polarized than ever before. Maybe that's the reason why in a small town in Quinnell, in someone's small house, we have Christians in the same room and some are like, I hope you stuck it to the government. Some people hope you obeyed the government. And some people said, I just... I'm not getting into this. <laughs> and there we are. You see, here we are with Jesus in Mark chapter 15. And for the first time in the gospel of Mark, we have Jesus not in front of religious people, religious establishment, or, but we have him in front of the political establishment. He's not in front of religious leaders, but the government, the state, the Roman state, Pilate. And so for the first time in the Gospel of Mark, we have to ask the question, what is the relationship to, of church to state, of Jesus to politics, of Christianity to the government? It's a pretty hot question. There's three questions that Pilate asked Jesus in Mark 15, verse 1 to 15. He asks, are you king of the Jews? He asks Jesus, why aren't you fighting back? Then he asks the crowds, what shall we do with this king? The answer to these questions are a lens by which we explore the passage. It shows us how Jesus responds to politics. 
We look at those three questions today. Are you king of the Jews? Why aren't you fighting back? What should we do this king? That Jesus' three responses to this, these questions, the first answer to this question might really annoy you. The second answer to Pilate's question might surprise us. And the third answer could potentially change you. So let's get into this in Mark chapter 15, verse 1. If your Bibles, we use a translation called the CSB. And so go there in your app or on the screen. It says, As soon as it was morning, having held a meeting with the elders, scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin, the chief priests tied up Jesus, led him away, handed him over to Pilate. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. The chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate questioned him again, Aren't you going to answer? Look how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus did not answer. So Pilate was amazed. At the festival, Pilate used to release for the people a prisoner for whom they requested. There is one named Barabbas who was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during the rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as was his custom. Pilate answered him, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew it was because of envy the chief priests had handed him over, but the chief priests stirred up the crowds so he would release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate asked them again, Then do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Again, they shouted, Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. One to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. Crucified. So when Pilate asks, are you king of the Jews? He asks this question. And Jesus gives a very ambiguous response. He gives a response that so often in the Gospels kind of leave us a little bit annoyed, right? It's like, can't you be a little more clear? Can't you be like a little more clear on what your political affiliation is, your allegiance, what your political plan is? See, what Pilate's asking here, he says, are you king of the Jews? He's not asking a theological question. He's not asking about the Old Testament. Are you the one that they prophesied in the scriptures? What he's actually asking about is, are you a political leader? Will your movement have political implications for me as a ruler? Will you as a leader have any impact on the patterns of political power in my region, in my area, in the world? That's all he cares about. He's not asking a theological question. He's actually asking a very specific question about politics, political power. He's asking, do you have any political impact? Are you a political leader? Is this a political movement in any way? Should I be fearful of you? You see, it's, it's crucial for us today to see that Jesus is deliberate, deliberately and significantly ambiguous in his answer. See, just a, about a chapter ago, the Sanhedrin, in front, the, front of them, when they ask, are you the Christ? Are you the king? What does he say? He says, absolutely. He was very clear. But here in front of Pilate, when he says, are you king of the Jews? He says, you say so. He's being ambiguous. He's not being clear. He says, you say it with the emphasis on you, Pilate. Now, what is this? Is it a denial or is it an affirmation? Another way to put it, it's both a denial and an affirmation. Jesus could have said, no, 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 actually, like, of course I'm, I'm not a political leader. I'm a spiritual person. I'm building a spiritual kingdom. He could have said that. Maybe he could have said, I just bring people spiritual peace and happiness in their personal lives. And what I'm doing is not going to have any impact politically. But he doesn't say that. On the other hand, he doesn't say, yes, of course I'm a political leader. His answer really is so ambiguous that it must have just frustrated Pilate. 
Because he says, yeah, I am, but I'm also I'm not. See, what he's going to do is he have lots of political ramifications. But he's not a political leader in his category, in Pilate's category. He's not a politician. His answer is, I am political, but I'm also I'm not political. <laughs> See, if you want to follow Jesus at all, you cannot fall on one side or the other. You look at any other spiritual movement. You say to Buddha, are you a political leader? His answer would be no. If you say to Muhammad, are you a political leader? The clear answer would be yes. If you say to Jesus, are you a political leader? The clear answer is yes and no. You see, do you see the difference? You see, Christianity is unlike anything else. See, Jesus here is being very deliberate to Pilate in being ambiguous. There's another place in Mark chapter 12, if you go back a little bit, where Jesus is also ambiguous. And people ask him, should you pay taxes? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus grabs a denarius, a coin, and he says, whose image is on this coin? And they say, Caesar's. And Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's the things that are God's. And again, it's deliberately ambiguous. <laughs> Isn't that frustrating sometimes? It's like, what is it? Jesus, tell us. When he says, whose image on the coin, we look back on that, the inscription was a picture of Tiberius Caesar. But the inscription of the denarius said, Tiberius, king, son of God. See, it was a claim of absolute allegiance that we have to keep in mind that we're talking about the culture that Jesus was in. All the governments claimed absolute allegiance. All governments were totalitarian. The temples and the states were mutually support each other. The governments were always done in the name of gods. The emperor or the king, in some cases, were considered a god. That there was no idea of a limited state, no idea of a state in which you had human rights or space for human rights or space for conscience or protest. Jesus shows up. And what he's saying here is basically, Caesar's image on that coin Give him the money, it's his. But you and me, if you follow Jesus, God's image is on you. And give to God's what is God's. That your ultimate allegiance, if you believe in Jesus, isn't to a coin or possession, it's to God. So on one hand, he says, sure. Political engagement, of course, pay your taxes. <laughs> Jesus is saying, be engaged. He's not saying withdraw from the government. Don't with withdraw from our society. But on the other hand, he says, well, you know, don't you, don't you dare agree with everything. When the, any government makes any totalitarian claim over you or me, don't agree to that. Because when God's law and human law contradict, God always comes first if you believe in Jesus. And that was revolutionary for the time. And sometimes it puts us in spots that are very sticky in our time. Isn't it? I think about our political climate. I remember meeting a, a friend of mine who was who's American, I don't know if you have any American friends. And we're sitting down one night and, and this person said, well, you're from Canada, you're a socialist. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they go, well, you, like, you pay so many taxes to help the poor out. And, and he, this person said, well, I'm not at all like that. I'm a Republican because I'm a Christian. <laughs> I was like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't realize that's like the... Jesus' party in the States. You see, there's going to be things, there's going to be policies as a Christian that you like about certain political parties. But no political party is Jesus. You might 
be attached to a political party because you like their stance on abortion. The fact that they're, they're pro-life. But you also might like a political party because they actually care about the poor and the marginalized. See, Jesus here answers with a very ambiguous question. Is Christ leading a political movement? Yes and no. <laughs> if it's too yes for you or too no for you, we're in trouble. But you say, well, how does Christianity, if it's not all direct, if it's actually quite ambiguous here, what Jesus is talking about, if it's not taking power and ruling in Christ's name, how does Christianity change a culture? How does it change a people? How does it change me or you? It goes to the next question. In verse 3 and 4, when, when he says to Jesus, when Pilate says to Jesus, why are you fighting back? The chief priests, they're actually accusing you of so much stuff. Jesus, why are you fighting back? See how many things they're accusing you of? Why are you quiet? Because any politician, if you've ever seen a politician, they talk their way out of things. Like, Jesus, why are you more of a politician? Why aren't you, like, making, spinning it, blame shifting? Why are you working through the angles? Pilate's saying is they're killing you. They're leading you to death. Look at what they're doing. Look at the charges. Look at everything they've been doing. And look at what you're doing. You're not fighting back, Jesus. Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? See, Pilate was a man of the world. And this is where Christianity looks so different than anything else in the world. He was trying to figure out what Jesus was going to do next. Look at the answer. It says, Jesus made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Amazed. You know, I've looked at this passage before in numerous ways, and I've never really understood Pilate's response until I looked at commentaries this past week. And the word amaze is a very positive word. That Pilate was not just saying, you idiot, you fool. He wasn't amazed like that. The word has a connotation of wonder and marvel. That Pilate saw something that Jesus was doing that amazed him. He saw the contrast between Jesus and his enemies. He saw something so revolutionary, it surprised him. It amazed him. It stunned him. He saw a contrast. See, on one hand, his enemies were frantic. They were afraid he was going to get off that Jesus is so calm. On the other hand, his enemies are using power to harm him. And what does Jesus do here? By saying nothing. He's laying down his power to forgive his enemies. That's pretty astounding. Because every revolution that's ever happened happened by taking power asserting power over someone, destroying your enemies. And Pilate's sitting there and he sees Jesus and he realizes that it's so different that Jesus' kingdom's not coming to, to take power from Pilate. That he's bringing power by forgiving enemies. By loving people. This new personal peace that Jesus is bringing, this new pattern for power, came into his followers in the early church. You realize that the early Christians, when they used their faith at work, it helped people who were marginalized. That Christians were well known for rescuing babies. That in a first century world, I was reading this past week that they said that there's something like, like 15 boys for one girl that was born. And you say, what, what is that? Is that water? No, it's just 
they got rid of baby girls. Christians showed up and said, actually, this is unacceptable. That we are going to rescue these babies, raise them. That we're gonna actually going to elevate the rights of women. You see, Christians were called by Jesus not just to love their enemies, but to actually change the society they were in by loving and forgiving. See, Pilate shows up and he sees Jesus and he's like, what is your problem, Jesus? Like, are you going to take power? Are you going to overthrow Rome? Because that's what Peter just wanted in Garden of Semini. He just cut a guy's ear off. Peter wanted political power. But your power looks so different that it surprised Pilate. It should surprise us. Shouldn't it? We think we are enemies. Do you have enemies? <laughs> Maybe you don't. Remember my son came home from school one day and I was like, do you want to see this so-and-so, your friend? And he goes, that's my enemy now. I was like, oh, wow. Like, are we in a superhero show? <laughs> I didn't really know no, you guys have enemies and allies. You see, we have people that have done wrong to us. And Jesus shows up and people betrayed him. People have abandoned him. And Pilate's asking him, what is your kingdom like? He says, it's so different than yours, Pilate, by not speaking. It's so different than anything you've ever thought of. That's all about love and forgiveness. But the last question Pilate asks basically turns to the crowd and he asks them, what should I do with this king of the Jews? Should I release him? Why not? What should I do to him? What should I do with this Jesus? And the answer to the crowd is one thing, crucify him. But it's one thing for us, it's substitution. You see, when you see when he says, what should I do with Jesus? The crowd says, you have a guilty guy in there, Barabbas, an insurrectionist, someone who's trying to overthrow the Roman emperor, who's guilty of murder, who's led a rebellion. You have a guilty person and you have an innocent person, Jesus. You know, the last question Pilate asked the crowd in Mark's gospel is what has this man done? Verse 14, what has he done? What has Jesus done? And they just skip over it. They gloss over it. They push it aside. They say, crucify him, kill him. Have you ever had someone just like push you to the brink? <laughs> Have you ever had someone just like poke and poke and poke and poke and poke to you like, just get on my face? Have you ever had that? Pilate's asking, what has this man done? And the crowd is so riled up, it's so angry that they can't even think clearly. Have you ever been so angry you just can't think clearly? Or you're just like, I just need a moment to get my thoughts back in my mind. And the crowd just shouts out, crucify him. Just crucify him and kill him. They don't even answer the question of Pilate. See, in a way, what they're saying is, we know he's innocent, but we want him dead. That's substitution. Here's the innocent and here's the guilty. Let's switch them. Let's substitute them. Let's put the innocent where the guilty should be and the guilty where the innocent should be. Let's take the innocent one and punish him and the punishable one and treat him as he's innocent. So we call in Christianity a substitution. See, how much more clear can Mark be? Is this what Jesus' death was all about? This is what it's all about. It's about substitution. It's about us. It's about our record. It's about us being a criminal, an innocent one. Jesus dies for us. You see, in the early days of Christianity, 
They didn't look to Jesus just as an example. They didn't say, oh, he died for others, he loved others, he gave up his power and forgave his enemies, and that just inspires us, it actually empowers us. No, it changes us. It will change you. See, Pilate knew this, that you could stop any revolutionary like Barabbas. How do you do it? You kill them. He thought he could stop this Jesus rebellion by killing him. See, how do you stop Jesus? When they nailed him to a cross, they didn't realize that in turn nailing him to the cross, they were putting the cross, the sinful nature of all humanity on to God. That Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross was more than just being a political radical that Pilate thought he was. It was God's answer to our dilemma, to a human dilemma. That every dilemma that every politician wants to fix, <laughs> every generation wants to fix the next generation, right? It's like, we're going to balance budgets and we're going to make things better. We're going to make it a better culture to live in. And here we are. You see, Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross. And he was the answer to the human dilemma. That he bore the sins of the world in his own body. And he was proclaiming our liberation on that cross. Our freedom on that cross. He shed his blood to cleanse us of our sin and to set us truly free. He says, you know, they, then they buried him and rolled a stone over the grave, wiped their hands, essentially. The Romans were like, okay, and we just stopped the rebellion. Let's keep on going, right? Oh, what happened? They thought Jesus would never disturb them ever again. This movement would be dead in a grave, in a tomb. See, three days later, Jesus pulled off what might be the greatest political coup of all time, that he got up out of the grave, that he rose from the dead. It establishes a whole new order, a whole new way of living. What Jesus is saying here is that you can go into the world that's enslaved, just like Kelowna, a world that's filled with hunger and poverty and racism and all those things that are work of the devil. And you can proclaim the real liberation to the captives. You and I can bring that good news to our neighborhood, to our families, to ourselves. You can preach, the, preach sight to the blind. You can set at liberty all that's been bruised and broken, destroyed. I'm going to bring the, the band back up as we kind of close this out. You can go into the world and tell everyone who, that's bound mentally, spiritually, physically that there is someone who is better than any politician, better than any government, than any power that's ever existed on earth, and that's Jesus. And following Jesus sometimes will, will annoy you because you want clear answers. What should I do next, Jesus? Is this your will or not your will? There's moments where it's going to surprise you. How can I forgive that person from what they did to me, but you're actually, you forgave me, therefore I have to actually show them love and compassion. It surprises you. The last thing is when you look at Jesus and you see that he was a substitutionary atonement for you, that he died in your place, it changes you. See, every, every, every other revolution puts new people in power. That's the point of a, a revolution, is to put someone new in power. And Jesus says, I'm going to put a new attitude towards power in power. <laughs> that every religion, every revolution destroyed their enemies. But this revolution of Jesus is coming to forgive your enemies. Jesus' revolution can't be stopped by killing him. 
So we look at the question, is Jesus a political leader? The answer is yes and no. You see that the, the revolutionary aspect of following Jesus will actually make you live differently every single day. We're coming to communion today. And we're going to have Richard and Carrie come and they're going to stand in the front. And if, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is a remembrance of the fact that Jesus Christ lived and died for you. That his body was broken for you. His blood was poured out for you. And we're doing it a little bit different today. Okay, so we're going to take, a, take the bread, which symbolizes his body being broken for you. And you're going to dip it in the cup. And you're going to say, take it. But just take your time. Reflect on the fact that Jesus is your atonement. He's your substitution. That he loves you so much that he died for you and me in our place. That in this story that we're the Barabbases. We're the criminal. And you've just been set free. It changes everything about us. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. Show us how we are the Barabbas in the story. Change us, shape us, mold us. Would we see you, Jesus, for who you are? Holy Spirit, convict us right now of our sin, our brokenness. Lead us into repentance. Would we see you restore us, the greatest gift we can give to our families, our friends, is us being changed and transformed by you, Jesus. Amen.